personally, I hope I bore you to death today with a 7 and nothing shutout or something like that. But uh, if not, I hope you enjoy the game. Have a good day. Got a chance, Mike! NBC Sports presents the Major League Game of the Week. Today, from Anaheim Stadium, the Baltimore Orioles versus the California Angels. The Game of the Week is brought to you by Miller Lite. For great taste, there's only one light beer. By Mr. Goodwrench. No one knows your GM car better than Mr. Goodwrench. No one. By John Deere and your local John Deere dealer. And by Delta Airlines. Delta gets you there with care. And we're just in time for the first pitch of the day. A breaking ball for a strike. Hi, everybody. A very pleasant good day to you, wherever you may be. I'm Ben Scully, along with Joe Garagiola. And you're looking at the designated hitter in the leadoff spot, Alan Wiggins. He'll be followed by Jim Dwyer and then Cal Ripken. Just the start of things. Little pop fly to the left side. Backing out is Dick Schofield. One away. Let's take a look at Mike Witt, and then we can give you the starting lineup. Mike Witt comes in with a record of five and two. No record against Baltimore this year. Four and eight lifetime. He's won three straight and his record at home three and one. And now we'll show you the men he's going to be pitching to leading the majors in home runs. The Baltimore Orioles with 55. You saw Wiggins pop up. Now you have Jim Dwyer who homered last night. For Baltimore it has been a case of home runs. A one hopper picked up on the second by Joyner. Two down. We have a moment now to look at the lineup. Alan Wiggins, Jim Dwyer, and Cal Ripken. Eddie Murray in the cleanup spot. Fred Lynn in center field. Then Ray Knight, Terry Kennedy, Larry Sheets, and Rick Burleson. The Orioles with 55 home runs have been so hot they've hit 27 home runs in the last eight games. And you go back to the 77 Boston Red Sox they hit 30 home runs in a nine game stretch and they went on to lead the lead. Strike to Cal Ripken. Ripken leading the American League in RBIs tied for the lead in home runs and hits. Playing in game number 801 consecutively. Fouled away. It's the way you like to see a pitcher start off, Ben. He's made five pitches, all strikes, uh, two good curveballs of Wiggins. He got Dwyer on the first pitch, and he's way ahead of uh, Cal Ripken. And as you can see by the numbers, he has a long way to go to get towards the top five, 801 games. But the incredible part of the Cal Ripken story is the string of consecutive innings. I mean he plays every inning of every game. A lot of streaks have been kept alive by a brief pinch hitting appearance. He has played seven thousand two hundred and fifty eight innings. And for baseball people there's one more. He is Nurse's dad the manager of course. He has never missed infield practice and there's a great deal of significance to that. And talking to his father he said he is preparing himself that day for that game. Never misses infield. So quite a player up there. Cal Ripken fouls that one down the right field line out of play. On deck is another man. There's the Ripken family. Billy not quite ready yet. He's a second baseman playing triple A. He might very well be here so that you would have the double play combination of Griffins managed by a Ripken. Eddie Murray. Incredible display of what he's been doing of late to capture everybody's attention. Ground ball to short. And Schofield takes care of him. So Baltimore is gone in order and at the end of half an inning Baltimore nothing and the Angels coming up. There's the Angel lineup and they'll be facing Scott McGregor who comes in with a one and five record his victory a three hit shutout against Minnesota. He is 0 and 4 in Baltimore. Well he has done well here lifetime against the Angels in Anaheim 11 and 3 and his career record of 19 and 7 most victories versus any other team in the American League. He's coming off a very disappointing year last year. 
It was his first losing season since way back in 1977. And he is a local boy. He's from Inglewood, grew up in El Segundo, went to school with George Brett, and now he's against Downing, Joyner, and White. Downing, one of the better leadoff men in all of baseball. That's right. He's hitting close to 350 in his first at bat. I mean, you had better be ready when Brian walks up to the plate because he is. If there's one thing you want to really watch with McGregor is his delivery. Number one, he stands way to the first base side of the mound, and he kind of unfolds as he comes at you. Uh, Hopper at third. Nice play there by Ray Knight to throw him out. So Brian Downing, uh, one hopper to Ray Knight, one away. Let's take a look at that motion. He kind of hesitates and then comes over the top. Uh, he's ready to feel his position. He changes speeds a lot. They said he struck out Gladden the other day on a 78-mile-an-hour fastball, and Gladden was way out in front of it. They said, yeah, he was looking for a 50-mile-an-hour. <laughs> he really changes speeds well. Here's Wally Joyner, and, of course, the last time we saw Wally was last Saturday. He had a big day against the Boston Red Sox, and when the game was over, received the crushing news, the death of his brother. And he has just rejoined the Angels last night and back in the lineup again. A little late on that fastball, and it's a high foul down the left field line, slicing back into the seat. So Wally Joyner trying to time the fastball was late. Ben, just uh, last week talking about Joyner and the tragic loss of his brother, what a tough day it was for Gene Mock. I'd ask him because uh, Wally's mother had called right before the game to tell him, and Gene didn't say anything to Wally until after the game. And he said, here he was hitting a home run, and all I could do was pat it, and couldn't even shake hands with him because I knew uh, what a heavy heart he would have. The, the real heaviness about the mock joiner relationship, as we saw Gene a moment ago, it was the second time in his career he knew of a tragedy and had to keep it to himself until after the game. He was the one who had to tell Cal McLish, mm -hmm. a pitcher, that his daughter had been killed in an automobile accident. A drive to center, Lynn, a late start, picked it off. In fact, Gene said after the game, what made it so dreadful was it not only did he have another terrible message to deliver, but it brought back the previous pain as well. There's the defense. Sheets, Lynn, you saw him make the good play. Dwyer's in right field. Knight, Ripken, Burleson, Murray at first base. Kennedy behind the plate. McGregor on the mound. Kennedy, coming over from the National League, has to learn the pitches he's facing and the pitches he's catching. Well, here's Devon White and a great comebacking play by Scotty McGregor to get Devon, who has a seven-game hitting streak. So McGregor helps himself. The Angels are gone in order, and at the end of an inning, no score. Here's that last play. Look at McGregor, first base side of the mound. Now watch how he kind of comes at you, different whoop over the top, and he's ready to feel his position, and he had to be to get that one almost over his head. Of course, once he gets it, it's an easy out, but he helps himself on the mound, man. Indeed he does, and of course, remember, he is bigger success as Mike Witt and Scotty McGregor hook up, and it's McGregor's time to just cool off a little bit. Eddie Murray followed by Freddie Lynn and then Ray Knight. Murray has just been awesome. He has seven home runs in his last eight games. He has driven in 12 and scored 13. Imagine that. He's been involved in 25 runs in his last eight games. And he bangs it, but keeps it in the ballpark. So Mike Witt holding Murray to a single. And Witt continues to throw strikes. And Murray, just an, just a good hitter. What else can you say? Record proves it. Uh, when he wasn't hitting, man, it was because of injuries. And then Frank Robinson, talking to him, said he had a little mechanical flaw where his hands were too close to his body, not allowing to get his arms out. But then Frank was quick to add, hey, the player has to make the adjustment. He has to work. And that's what Murray did. And, of course, for him to get a base hit against the Angels, uh, that's almost redundant. They, they just seem to go together. Ball one to Freddie Lynn. Murray's lifetime average against the Angels is over 333. So when we said he kept it in the ballpark, I guess for Mike Witt, that was an accomplishment. For Baltimore, they were the only team in the American League last year to have a losing record at home. 
And they're still up to their old tricks. They're five games under 500 at home. Freddie Lynn with an eight straight hitting streak. Oddly enough, one thing this Baltimore club hasn't been able to do is manufacture runs. I mean, they get home runs, but I mean, manufacture. Look at that, five home runs, 11 RBIs in eight games where they can get the stolen base or whatever. And that's what Cal Ripken uh, is trying to get this club to do is manufacture some runs and, and he'll run some people. Sure. Sure. He's got good speed. Show you how important Fred Lynn is. Last year, Baltimore was four games over 500 in the games where he started. And they were 20 games under 500 when he didn't start. But in Fred Lynn's career since 1980, he misses 25% of the games each year. And this year, he had a bruised rotator cuff of the left shoulder. He had to have a cortisone shot. And you go down his anatomy, it's like Gray's Anatomy, the textbook. A Lynn way out in front of it. Freddie, so far in his career, as he faces six foot seven inch Mike Witt, has hurt his ankle, his knee, his wrist, his back, his groin, his foot, his toe, his rib, and his shoulder. <laughs> Otherwise, he's in great shape. He's got a good pair of eyebrows. Yeah, Murray at first, nobody out second inning. Two and two. Fouled away down the left field line out of play. Fred Lynn, of course, facing Mike Witt, played for the Angels. Fred started with the Red Sox, and then he played here from 81 through 84. And he lives down the road at Rancho Mirage. Cal Ripken, the manager, controls the count as far as steal. Now, Murray took a good look at his first base uh, coach, Terry Crowley. I mean, he just doesn't turn him loose. He wants to control the count. You don't run on Mike Wood very often, either. Got him. And that's why you don't, because he's a strikeout man. There were only, and Cal Ripken knows it full well, there were only 15 attempts to steal a base against Mike Witt last year, and only five men succeeded. So he's a big, tall string bean, gives you a lot of knee bow, elbows, and knees, and you name it. And he's got that good overhand curveball, that kind of on the playground we used to call a drop. It's an overhand curveball that starts about at your letters, ends up about at your knees. Ray Knight has a five-game hitting streak and is hitting well again. Fouled away. Knight started off the year in great style, and then he was injured in a collision with Buddy Biancolana. He was sliding. Biancolana was crossing the bag at second, and Biancolana's knee hit Ray Knight in the head. He suffered a concussion. He had a blood clot in his throat, and it took him a while to come back from that. Now, evidently, he's fully recovered. Talked with Ray before the game, and he was also mentioned the kidney stone operation, but he also talked about all the other distractions, you know, the not signing the contract with the Mets and this, that, and the other thing. He said, finally, I'm just playing baseball. He's happy to be doing that. Yeah, I'm sure. He had an interesting touch last year with the New York Mets. There goes Murray, and it's fouled away in the count one and two. This is what happened to Ray Knight in April he's going to be going into second base now watch Buddy Bianco the left knee hit night right in the forehead and he went down last year he hit a home run in the opening game for the New York Mets he hit a home run in the last game of the year for the New York Mets and he hit a home run in the final game of the World Series to clinch it for the Mets Murray was going on the last pitch Swing, no swing, says Ted Henry, the first base umpire. And the count two and two. The big curveball again, and I tell you, he started after it. The Ray Knight followed by Terry Kennedy. Yeah. 
on the fists a little foul off to the right and out of play so after the breaking ball down and away Knight nodding his head he was jammed by a pitch inside classic bit of pitching by Mike Witt yes sir I tell you Witt does so many things uh, his natural stuff uh, the biggest asset of course but with base runners he really holds that ball a little bit longer than most pitchers and, and that'll stop the runner uh, better than anything that, that you can do throwing over there will help stop him but but holding that ball two balls and two strikes to Ray Knight we're in the second inning no score curveball to left field but right at Darrell Miller. Well, you thought it was a curveball yeah. but he got the express. Well he put down number two and I was getting a sign from there and obvious uh, if you were on base you'd go back and tell you guys hey uh, we had the advantage of the center field camera but uh, it'll be interesting to watch Boone as we look at the defense Miller Pettis and White that's pretty good outfield. DeSensei made a great play last night at third base Schofield McLemore Joyner and Boone behind the plate. Two has always been a curveball, but it wasn't that time. Here's Terry Kennedy with Murray at first and two out. And Kennedy rolls it to Joyner, and Wally's on the bag, and that's it. So they leave Murray with a leadoff single, and at the end of an inning and a half, no score. You're looking at James Harrison Reese who will be 82 years old October the 1st and whose career in baseball began in 1917 as a bat boy for the Angels. That was the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. Later on as a player he roomed with Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees. He is so well loved in the clubhouse. The young guys were even kneeling him. Asked him how was it when you came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Desense followed by Darrell Miller and then Dick Schofield for the Angels to be looking at a left-hander and they saw left-hander Eric Bell last night. They figured to see some left-handers particularly for the next stretch because they will be playing Baltimore followed by the Yankees followed by Toronto during their 10 game homestand. They will then go out on the road an eight game road trip and you can bet they'll see every left-hander available. One reason the fact that George Hendrick is still sidelined. So they got Bell last night. They get McGregor today. They'll get Flanagan tomorrow. When they play the Yankees, chances are they'll see Tommy John, Dennis Rasmussen. Who knows? They might even see Ron Guidry. And certainly when they see Toronto, they'll see Jimmy Key. So they're going to be looking at a lot of left handers. And Desense draws the wall. So Scotty McGregor working now on Daryl Miller. McGregor has been Jekyll and Hyde. Through the 1983 season, he was an extremely successful pitcher. Since 83, he has not even been breaking even. And as we told you, he had a losing record last year for the first time since 1977. Daryl Miller at the plate. And the butt is down. McGregor takes care of it. We mentioned it last week, but it is certainly worthy of repeating. The Angels sacrificed more than any team in the American League, and I mean a lot more. Last year, 35 times more than anybody else. So Gene Mark believes in the sacrifice bunt. The old baseball theory, get a run before you give a run. Well it'll be up to Dick Schofield and he is struggling right now and he's followed by Bob Boone. Schofield has held only four hits in his last 35 trips to the plate. Big slow curveball in there for a strike. That took a half hour to get to the plate. Oh, I tell you, <laughs> he can change speed so well. The thing about him, he's a pitcher you have to let settle in. They kid him about being six hit McGregor. 0 oh and 1. Now the fastball, and he was late. Fly ball into right center. Jim Dwyer is there. Desense tagging to draw a throw, but he didn't fool anybody. And it's a perfect throw to third base anyway. Dug in a score. We were talking about Jimmy Key. Well, he's been roughed up by Oakland. Mark McGuire hit a three run home run for Oakland. Boy, that kid's hot. 
Boy, the guy that's hot is an Aussie Virgil, oh, huh? Yeah. Is that amazing? <laughs> There's Bob Boone. He has a six-game hitting streak. He has, as you can see, just two runs batted in. So you have two down to Sensei at second and Booney trying to pick him up. Ball one. Boone, among other things, coming back had a sore wrist. He was out for a while. Daryl Miller, who's playing left field, has been catching. And Butch Weiniger, who figured to be the backup catcher, has an infected toe and might need surgery. Of course, the Angels have a lot of people hurting. Jack Howell has a bad back, although he might be ready to play this weekend. Weiniger with the toe. John Candelaria had a back problem, but he has more problems than that. Arrested for the second time in three weeks for driving under the influence. So he's on the DL for personal reasons. McCaskill underwent surgery. And Donnie Moore with sore ribs still pitched three innings last night. Pop fly, Burleson out, Lynn in, Burleson. So they leave to Sensei at second. And at the end of two, no score. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. Frank, you're a little more familiar with home runs than I ever was. Some people say it's the ball that's juiced up. Is it the ball or is it the Baltimore hitters who are really on a rampage? Well, Joe, I think it's one thing. I don't think it's the ball. When Eddie Murray starts hitting and he hits his home runs, everybody in this ball club starts hitting because when Eddie Murray does it, it gets contagious. It takes the pressure off everybody else. They relax and everything falls into place. So Frank Robinson, that's how much he knows about home runs. Larry Sheets, Rick Burleson, and Alan Wiggins will be coming up. No score here in the third inning. Larry Sheets leading the club with that 391 average. Last year, he really was a Mr. Clutch. He drove in 10 of 12 runners from third base with less than two outs. So he figures prominently in the Baltimore attack. Fouled away. Big Valley, 6'3, 225. And blazing hot. Of course, as hot as they are and as troubled physically as the Angels are, the Angels are in much better shape. The Angels are a half a game behind Kansas City. And meanwhile, Baltimore, seven games back of the Yankees. Interesting watching Boone given one curveball, two fastball. He's turned it around. Huh? It, it, the last two pitches. Let's see now if it happens. One inside. So yeah, yeah, let's this, see if it's fastball or curve. But uh, fastball. No. I have to disagree with you. Let's watch it again. Whit working on Larry Sheets. What do you say now? Well, I thought it was a fastball. I right, see the pitch. High fly ball into right field. Devon White going back to the track and puts it away. So a long out to right, one down. Take another look at that pitch. Not the good hard fastball. Is it a slider? Uh-uh. What do you think? Boss? Think it had a little wrinkle on it? I would have to say it did. Well, we'd like to remind our viewers we'll be selecting the NBC Miller Lite player of the game at the conclusion of the ball game. And here's Rick Burleson. No score. We're in the third inning. Rick Burleson playing second base. And that's interesting because he played second base only six times in the past 10 years prior to last season. Burleson is another local boy from Linwood, grew up in Southgate and lives in La Habra Heights, California. He played for the Angels from 81 through 86. Strike. And he played out his option and signed with Baltimore. Well, he made two pretty good pitches on him right on that outside corner. One and two to Rick. Always been a good hitter. Hit 284 last year. That's two how balls, two strikes. I started saving. That's how Boone tries to get that, that pitch by framing it. You saw him catch it with the face of the glove down and just kind of slide it over. Fast 
fast ball hit late and down the right field line and Devon White comes over and tries to pluck it and made the catch disappearing from our view but Ted Henry the first base umpire was right down the line this kid is going to be a great center fielder he's playing right field or left field but he's going to be an outstanding center fielder no two ways about it fine play he's loaded with talent Devon White and the batter now is Alan Wiggins who lined out to short takes a strike Wiggs is switch hitter and has higher numbers the other way around but has not had any luck at all against Mike Witt. what Wiggins does will be very important to Baltimore their number one problem last year Baltimore had the least productive leadoff spot in the American League and they used nine different players in the leadoff spot and they just could not get anything started. Their leadoff hitters were last in batting average slugging run scored next to last getting on base. They, they had just no leadoff man. And if you're making a scouting report on Wiggins you can see the Angels are going to try to keep from letting him hit the fastball have been breaking pitches so far. One and two. And the fastball hit over the mound, charging his Schofield to get him. So Mike Witt has retired six in a row, and at the end of two and a half innings, no score. When the team that leads the major leagues in home runs meets a team with a decimated pitching staff, you figure to have a blowout, but not when Mike Wood is pitching. He really has great natural stuff, but that pitching staff is really in bad trouble. Uh, they're they're going to have to get help from uh, Henry and Frazier and, and hope that the bullpen can do it with a guy like Vice, but uh, their pitching is really hurting. Fouled away on the first pitch as Gary Pettis, followed by Mark McLemore and then Brian Downing. When you look at the Angel pitching staff, you can realize what a tough go it is and will be for Gene Mark, certainly for the next 18 games. Line drive right at shortstop to Ripken, one away. Since they'll be playing Baltimore, the Yankees, and Toronto, and Mike Witt is really the only pitcher who's done a job at all. Don Sutton has had his problems, Candelaria now sidelined, and Gene was hoping to go with those three pitchers. Orbano Lugo has been sent as long man in the bullpen. Sutton had a 4 nothing lead in the first inning last night, just disappeared. And with Lugo in the bullpen, Fraser going tomorrow, and Donnie Moore having to be used very judiciously, you can see that, well, to sum it up, there will have the Angels. will have three youngsters in the starting rotation by next week who were not in the major leagues last year. They'll have to just keep scratching and clawing until they can get that bullpen in to uh, nail it down. Ben, let me ask you something. When Sutton was sitting there in the dugout with the baseball, you don't think he's fingering it and hoping to come up with a fork ball, which has been the salvation of so many. Well, of course, I wouldn't be surprised. Remember when we saw Steve Carlton? Right, right. Exactly what I was thinking. Pop fly back a shortstop. Ripken going out. So two down as McLemore with a little four game hitting streak pops it up and Brian Downing will be coming up. The Baltimore Orioles when they had a losing year last year it was shocking because they had had 18 consecutive winning seasons. In fact Baltimore had one of the truly great spans of success in any professional sport. The New York Yankees had a stretch of 39 years of winning seasons. In hockey, the Montreal Canadiens went 32 years with winning seasons. In football, the Dallas Cowboys went 20 years. And the Boston Bruins went 19 years. And then you have the Baltimore Orioles, 18 straight winning seasons. A remarkable accomplishment. breaking ball there you can see the most successful organizations over the last 30 years Baltimore top the heap 
It's interesting too for Baltimore to finish last in the last eight years that the Browns were in St. Louis before they moved to Baltimore. They will last three times and next to last four times. But they got well on crab cakes. Fly ball to left center. Freddie Lynn. So that's six in a row retired by Scotty McGregor. And we have a pitching dandy going at the end of three. No score. It was last Tuesday. Rupert Jones batting against Dan Petrie of Detroit. Now watch what Mike Heath does. The pitch is in the dirt. He blocks it, shovels it out in front, takes the mask off, and tries to retrieve the ball with the mask. There were runners at second and third at the time. Gene Moore came out of the dugout, pointed out rule 705, paragraph D, which says that each runner may without liability be put out, advance two bases. If a fielder deliberately touches a thrown ball with his cap, mask, or any part of the uniform. So Heath was guilty, and what happened was the runner at third, McLemore, was allowed to score. Brian Downing went to third. A one in a million play. But of course, it shows you the struggles for the Angels when the manager is driving in runs. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting thing about that, it was a thrown ball. Usually it's a hit ball when they throw a glove at it or something. And Mike Keith said, I've been doing that all my career. Somebody should have nipped that in the bud. That's Jim a, Dwyer. That's a dumb rule. Yeah. It really is. I mean, what, what effect? It, it, but it is a rule, and that's the old story. Hey, oh, it's yeah. in there. Uh, Why? Nobody knows. And Gene knew it. Yeah. Somebody said to him, well, how could you possibly have had that rule at your fingertip? Base hit to left for Dwyer. And Mark said, I read it in a book somewhere. He said, well, do you read the rule book all the time? No, he said, I haven't read it in years. You can bet me. Uh-huh, I've got some swamp land in Florida. You got it. Yeah. Talking about Mark and his years managing from the youngest to the oldest, he has also managed over a 1,000 games more than any other active manager. Ripken and Eddie Murray. So Mike Witt is getting into the deep water now where the Sharks hang out. And there's a drive into right center field, and that's in the gap, and will go to the wall. Dwyer is to third, and remember, Murray is coming up next, so there's no reason to send him in. And they don't. So Ripken doubles up the alley in right center. Dwyer goes to third. Now, with nobody out in first base open, you wonder if they'll even look at Murray. He'll just take the bat right out of his hand. And that's why that fella batting behind you means so much. In the case of Murray, Freddie Lynn is the batter behind him. Early in the game, Witt has pretty good stuff, but it's a decision they'll have to make where maybe he'll chase the bad ball. And remember, Gene Mark absolutely hates to give an intentional walk. The Angels allowed the fewest number of intentional walks of any major league team. He will not give one up, and he's not going to give it up now. Oh, you can say he's not going to give him a strike, okay, but he is not going to walk him intentionally. Ball one. So Murray with a chance to get the birds off the ground here. No score in the fourth. Runners at second and third. Baltimore hasn't lost a season series to the Angels since 1978. They split 12 last year. Fast ball and he had a rip at it. One and one. Eddie Murray with a home run last night. And how about those numbers? One ball and one strike to Eddie Murray. Ball two. You know, another thing about Baltimore last year, they got a lot of men on base. In fact, Baltimore was the only team in the American League last year who had more men on base than the opponents had against them. And yet, Baltimore had a losing record. So they left a lot of people. Boy, the 
bottom dropped out of that thing. <laughs> that was that snake. That was the one they call Uncle Charlie right there. That's the one that makes broadcasters. Boy, is that mean. Look where it starts. And look where it ends up. And you don't really get the velocity from that shot, but that thing was moving. Mean pitch. Two and two. Little foul ball. Another thing we were mentioning about Baltimore last year couldn't win at home and they're not winning at home this year. You're looking at runners at second and third. You realize that Baltimore has already left the bases loaded 18 times this year. I mean it's been standing room only for Cal Ripken senior. Two and two. inside mm. boy if you're going to throw that hard fastball inside that's the spot would you say this is pitching a hitter tough oh uh, he really is he hasn't given him an inch he has really shown him his good stuff and in good spots it's one thing to have a good curveball but where are you throwing it he's had real good control of it so far three and two the count Eddie Murray no score in the fourth runners at second and third nobody out Little pop foul off third to Sensei. Can't. Oh, he hit his jaw. He hit his jaw. His Adam's apple. Adam's apple. He hit that pipe. Yep, that's the Adam's apple. Whoa. Oof. Earl Batty in the World Series. Remember that in, in Dodger, Dodger Stadium. Stadium? Yeah, he looked like he was going to oh, make that gosh. play. Mm. So Doug DeSensei fully extended a head on collision, and despite the fact that that railing is mm. padded, it's as if somebody just hit him in the Adam's apple. Hmm. He went down like it hit him on the jaw, but you could see it hit him right across the Adam's apple. And I tell you, having had some foul tips nail me there, Ben, oh, can, I can sympathize with him. Funny, when that happened, I was thinking of Earl Batty yeah. as you said it. That Watch this now. He will hit it head on with his head back. Right there. What oh, a, yeah. oh, my gosh. Doug is still down. And there was really no help he could get from his own players. Uh, Moose Stubing was right there with the towel, but it looked like Doug was going to handle it. And there's obviously a big out with Murray. So Doug DeSensei. There has been an outstanding third baseman. In fact, when you start talking about third baseman in the last several years, you would think of Mike Schmidt and immediately follow that with Doug DeSensei. And DeSensei, who has averaged better than 140 games, except for 83 when he was banged up. And we hope you'll be able to continue. That ball wasn't hit high enough for him to find the stands or the railing. I mean, you could see as he was going after it, he had his eye on that ball to make the play because he knows how big an out it would be to get Murray. And his trainer advising him stay down. And I would think he will have some trouble speaking and swallowing. And whether that will cause him to have to come out of the game remains to be seen. But what a a bizarre, somewhat freak play. Can't swallow. From the looks of things, he will not be able to continue. Near bits and pieces of conversation. He can't swallow, and they mentioned about the doctor. And he also appears to be very woozy. So Doug DeSensei, a solid man for the Angels, goes down on a freak accident. The sensei will be 37 in August.
This was that little foul ball off the bat of Eddie Murray. He knows he's close. You could see he was almost trying to feel, but he didn't get the top of the railing and just ran right into it. And you can see him grabbing that, that throat area. The left hand was going after the ball. The right arm and hand was fully extended, and he was groping for that area. After all, this is his ballpark. He knows it pretty well. But if you noticed, his right hand went under the railing. So he still thought he had a little room, and all of a sudden he was blindsided by the padding. So that's a... A terrible break for the veteran third baseman. And now we will see who will take over. Gus Polidor is certainly one who might wind up at third. We just have to wait and see. So time out. There's Polidor, but he does not have a glove. He's not showing any signs of loosening up or getting ready. Maybe DeSensei went back and perhaps a doctor will take a quick look at him. Den maybe Doug's going to try and tough it out. Denkinger is over on the Angel, right in front of the Angels dugout, the home plate umpire. Last Saturday, Jack Howell tried to make a diving catch and succeeded in Boston, but he hurt his lower back and he hasn't played since. Howell, who could play third base and left field, has not played since last Saturday and now looking at DeSensei. You get the feeling that he's going to come back and stay in there. And he is. Boy, that is great news. Oh, that's great. What a relief. So Doug DeSensei is hanging in there. And Eddie Murray will come back up with runners at second and third. Nobody out. Jim Dwyer singled and Cal Ripken doubled him to third. And Murray, who singled a ride in the second inning, goes all the way with Witt. Then Fred Lynn and Ray Knight. comes in Ripken goes to third and Murray picks up yet another run batted in so Eddie Murray picks up his 13th RBI in the last nine games he came close to sticking that thing on the wall too yes he did ball really carries exceptionally well here in the daytime so it is one to nothing Baltimore with a runner at third and one out. The batter is Fred Lynn who struck out in the second inning. Lynn earlier in the year had terrible numbers with runners in scoring position. It has improved of late and it will prove yet again as he hits a line drive single. The throw is going to come to the plate because the ball was hit and carried so far. It looked like Darrell Miller might catch it. So Ripken started to go back to tag up, and that made for a play, and he had to go back because it landed so close to the on-charging Miller. Now, and now he sees it lands. You saw how that stutter step, and he wanted to see where Miller was going to throw the ball. Miller comes to the plate. That ball was hit very hard, and I thought it might even get by him, but the grass is high both in the outfield and the infield, and uh, Ripken thought it was a base hit and then thought it was going to be caught, and he was stutter-stepping his way there. So Ray Knight with a five-game hitting streak, and he lined out to left in the second inning. Baltimore leading two to nothing in the fourth inning. Last time up, Knight played hit and run, so fouled it off, but he's a man that can handle the bat. Baltimore two, Angels nothing, top of the fourth inning. The O's exploding for two singles, a double, and a scoring fly ball. One ball, one strike. 
You know, I'm talking to manager Ripken about hit and run plays on his ball club. He mentions night. He says, when I put a hit and run play on, I don't want a guy to try to hit behind the runner. I want him to drive the ball. It's more like run and hit. One and one to count. Interesting, too, for Baltimore, it would appear that two of the comeback players of the year of 1986 are playing today in Baltimore uniform. Rick Burleson and Ray Knight. Ball two, two and one. Baltimore last year did not have any speed. In fact, they only had two triples the entire season at home. You don't get real base stealing in the American League that much if you take out a Ricky Henderson. The American League steals probably 30 percent less than the National League because of the DH. On a hit and run play, there's a fly ball to left field to Darrell Miller. To carry what you just said, Ben, a, a step farther, uh, Terry Kennedy, we're talking about the difference in leagues, and he summed it up by simply saying the National League is speed, the American League mm -hmm. is power. And I think the DH has uh, probably the biggest single factor where, and certainly Baltimore and Earl Weaver hung around always for that three-run home run. That's right. Hated the punt. Three-run home run. That was his best play. So here is Terry, who grounded out in the second inning. And it's a pretty simple figuring to understand why they went out and made a deal for a catcher there's a solid single to center field stopping at second base is Lynn Baltimore catchers last year combined had only 40 RBI the fewest in the major league so you knew that Hank Peters had to have a catcher who can swing the bat and he opted for Kennedy and Kel Ripken the manager really high on Kennedy he said he comes out and he has been working hard. He has really done a job and Cal the catcher himself in his playing days can really appreciate what Kennedy is going through learning both his pitchers and the opposing pitchers and Kennedy the other night hit a home run to beat Brett Saberhagen and it was Saberhagen's first defeat of the year when Terry hit it out. Larry Sheets one ball and no strikes and he is the seventh man to come up here in the fourth inning. Kennedy figures if he can stay around 250 until the middle of the year then he can do a little bit better knowing the, the pitchers. So Dwyer singled and Ripken doubled him to third. Murray's fly ball picked up Dwyer. Lynn's single scored Ripken and after night flight out Kennedy single to keep it going. So Lynn is at second and Kennedy is at first. Freddie Lynn at second base, an old base running trick, but he looks like a diplomat, an ambassador, going to a console carrying his pearl gray gloves in his hand. But actually, that will prevent him from dragging his hand if he has to slide. So he carries his glove. One and one. Ground ball to the right side. McLemore has the play to join her, and the inning is over. But Baltimore comes up with two, and at the end of three and a half, two nothing Baltimore. There is Bob Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy, Terry's mom and dad. Bob, of course, former GM player. He's done it all in baseball, Bob. Now working for the Giants here watching young Terry. There's the chip off the old block behind the plate and Wally Joyner Devon White and Doug DeCense big slow freight outside Joyner flied to center in the first inning Wally 0 for 1 what? big breaking ball strike one and one and Oakland inspired by McGuire's home run leading Toronto four to two and I don't think that spelling is correct for the McGuire family. Two and one. California last year one game above 500 against left hand pitching and they are one game under against left handers this year. That was one reason why George Hendrick figured so prominently to take a little heat off people like Joyner. Two and two. Fastball. 
Oh, yes, in the lineup, they have switch hitters. There are three switch hitters in the Angel lineup today Devon White, Gary Pettis, and Mark McLemore. But they could use Hendrick. Popped up on the left side. Ray Knight with the shades down. One out on the four, and the batter is Devon White. White hit sharply back to the box, and Scotty went up the ladder and made a nice play in the first inning to throw him out. White making an excellent play on the foul ball off Burleson's bat in the third inning. Big sweeping curveball, ball one. As you watch Kennedy give the sign, you see McGregor shake him around. It really proves that all you can do as a catcher is suggest. The pitcher has to make the decision. One and one. He knows exactly what he wants to do. They had a meeting before the game, and, and Cal Ripken says he just goes over all the hitters. Two and one. Scotty certainly has been breezing so far. He made the first three innings in less than 30 pitches. And he's a pitcher that has to settle in. Shot up the middle. So Devon White gets the Angels' first hit in the fourth inning with one out. And Doug DeCense will not come up. Here's the first base hit. Looked like he hit it kind of off the end of the bat, but perfect spot up the middle. Jack Howell, who has been out for a week with a bad back, and Howell is coming off the bench to hit for DeSensei. So Doug tried to stay in. As we told you, we heard him say he was having trouble swallowing and figured to be virtually impossible to play a game when you couldn't swallow. So Howell takes over for him. Howell just took some batting practice yesterday. He had been out with the bad back, pain in the lower back. We saw him make a dazzling catch last Saturday in Boston. He made a great diving catch on a ball hit by Ellis Burks. Ball one. So Jack Howell, outfielder, third baseman. He began his career in the California organization. He's a product of the club. Two to nothing in favor of Baltimore. Bottom of the fourth inning. McGregor and Witt. Slow curve, low ball two. They don't forget their college ties, though, man. Uh, Jack Howley, he, he looked for me today and says, hey, what about ASU and U of A? Because he went to the U of A, University of Arizona. He said, who won that game? I said, I don't know. I was here, too. <laughs> <laughs> 2 and 0 to Jack. And now McGregor flirting with trouble. Daryl Miller on deck, a right-hand hitter. And Scotty behind to a left-hand hitter, 3 and 0. Here's Darrell Miller. That's in there. Two runs, five hits for Baltimore for Gene Walks Angels. One hit so far. You see Jack Howell really opens up his stance. That right foot well on its way towards first base. There goes Devon White, swung on and missed. The throw, he's under the tag. Good throw, Devon White. Great speed. He had an, I would say, an average jump. May have taken a little bit of time getting rid of it, but head first slide made it. Oh, he's seven out of ten in stolen bases. 
Look at him reach for that bag. You know, a lot of guys in the head first slide, they slow down. Other guys pick up speed. He picked up some speed. And he went in very gracefully. Some fellas go in head first and wind up jamming their shoulders. They hit the bag as if they're throwing a block. So Terry did the job well enough, but Devon White steals it. Three and two to Howell, and a fake by McGregor. Last year, the Angels' success rate of stolen bases was best in the division. And he's walked him, so the time runs are aboard with one out. The batter will be Darrell Miller, who sacrificed in the second inning. He's been behind all three batters in this inning, which is in contrast to the way he started this game. We alluded to it by uh, they call him six hits McGregor because they figure he might give up three in the first inning and scatter out the rest of the, rest of the game when he settles down. But he usually is ahead. Though he has walked two, and each time it was a spot, Doug in the second inning and the man who hit for him, Howell in the fourth. The report on Doug DeSensei, and it certainly comes as no surprise, he has a bruised throat. So two on, one out, Daryl Miller, who's from nearby Yorba Linda. He began his career as a catcher, switched for two years in the outfield, went behind the plate and caught nine games this year, but he's back out in left field again. The name Miller is a prominent one, especially in sports. His brother Reggie stars for the UCLA basketball team, and his sister Cheryl was an All-American basketball player for USC. It's 2 nothing Baltimore, but McGregor in a little trouble. A base hit and a walk with one out. And a pickoff play late. But Burleson was right on White, but he was on the bag. He had been faking, throwing a second base, but Burleson was able to get in behind White, but not in time. That'll cut down your lead, though. Maybe give you a chance for a play at the plate. away or first base down the line and will carry to the top level and stay up there. Daryl Miller. Good sized kid, 6'2, 200 pounder. Big upper body. Mm. So I'm in the locker room before the game. He is strong. One and one to Daryl. Another pickoff play and the throw hits the and goes out into right center. White will score. Holding it second is Howell. McGregor's throw sails right into White. Burleson can't get it because Devon White is between him and the ball, and it caroms off. Oh, you see Burleson. And that ball sails right into white, right there. Hit him off the hip. You're going to get hit, boy. That's the spot to get hit. Perfect. Looked like he had a wallet. Hit him right on the wallet. So Ripken sees his defense let him down. The Baltimore area is an expensive one, and it's Baltimore two, Angels one. And just as important now, the tying run is at second base. And Jack Howell. And the double play is not in order. Well, McGregor. Battling to stay in front. One ball, one strike. He's missing with that big slow curveball, and the Angel hitters are laying off it. Two and one. Now he's in trouble. Three. that Scotty made 29 pitches in the first three innings. He's made 21 pitches already here in the fourth and they're moving around in the Baltimore bullpen. And he's walked him. Oh, 
He's well over the place now. Three walks, two in the inning. And Dick Schofield will be coming up. But meanwhile, Mark Wiley going out, and Ken Dixon begins to loosen up in the Baltimore bullpen. This is one of those spots when you stand out there as a catcher, you don't know what to say because you, you, you pitcher's in trouble. He knows it better than anybody, and you just wait for the pitching coach to come out and make his speech. Mark Wiley, the pitching coach, became the coach last October. He replaced Kenny Rowe. He's only the fifth to hold that position in the Orioles' 33-year history. Harry Brookeen, George Bamberger, Ray Miller, Ken Rowe, and now Mark Wiley. For Baltimore, a proud record of having 23 20 game winners in the last 19 years, the most in the majors. However, in the last six years, they've had only one 20 game winner, Mike Boddicker, in 84. So it is two to one in favor of Baltimore. McGregor in trouble, Howell at second, Miller at first, and Schofield, who flied to right in the second inning coming up. And Schofield having a lot of trouble of late with the bat. is made and coming over is Howell and he will beat the throw. So the time run is 90 feet away with two out. Now Bob Boone will be coming up. Boone with a six game hitting streak popped up in the second inning. And Boone is followed by Gary Pettis. Boone in a couple flares last night that dropped in for base hit. He just seems to be putting the bat on the ball. Although in Boston, that's the first time he walked up there, he whacked one right up against that wall, line drive. But last night, he just seemed to be wanting to put the bat on the ball, put it in play. Well, he's looking for an RBI. He has only two. And now he has a chance with a runner at third. Ripken and Knight on the infield. Sheets, Lynn, and Dwyer in the outfield. And it's McGregor and Kennedy. Fastball. Hit the center. Base hit. Miller is on his way to third. And we're all even 2-2. Two, two. Such a nice, easy swing. Just wanted to stroke the ball and want to drive it. Just put it in play, and that's exactly what he did. Right back up the middle. Here's the swing. Nice, soft. He served it. Love 40. Boone is a pretty good contact hitter anyway. He's up there just to meet the ball. Has only struck out once this year. He just put the bat on the ball. So in a 2-2 tie, the run is at first and third. The switch hitting Gary Pettis, who lined out to short in the third inning. Big off-speed pitch. This is what they'd like to see this young fella do. In fact, they talk about maybe he should get a big, thick handle bat, choke up on him, chop down, and run. He has already struck out 38 times this year. Half swing. My mother had a great expression. I first heard it when I was a little kid, and I would drive her to distraction, and she would finally say to me, you know, you would drive a saint to drink. <laughs> well, in a sense, when you look at Pettis and his tremendous speed, and then you realize that he struck out 132 times last year, it's really frustrating for his manager. And uh, 125 the year before, and 115 the year before that. When you have a fellow without power but who runs so well, all you want him to do is hit the ball on the ground. Like Matty Alou used to do. Sure. Two hopper and run. He hadn't been able to do it yet. Two and two. He has a big arc. He draws that back way back and then comes forward with it. And then uppercut. Right. And they've been trying for a couple of years to get him to hit down on the ball, but easier said than done. So Gary Pettis. 
0 for 1 with a chance to put the Angels in front with Miller at third and Boone at first. And there he goes again. And at the end of four, Baltimore 2, California 2. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. He grew up in Oklahoma with the legendary Dizzy Dean. In fact, as a 19-year-old shortstop, he even had a tryout with the St. Louis Cardinals Tulsa Farm Club. He decided not to play professional ball. He was a radio telegrapher and went on to fame and fortune, the chairman of the board, Gene Autry. And sitting to Gene's right, left on your screen, kind of back off camera, Robert Farnsworth. You might remember the movie The Gray Fox. You might also remember he played the part of the manager of the baseball team in The Natural. Or maybe is it Richard Farnsworth? I stand corrected. I'm sorry. Rick Burleson will start it off. He'll be followed by Alan Wiggins and then Jim Dwyer. Jack Howell now at third base for Doug DeSensei. Slider ran away, ball two. Burleson fouled out. Devon White made a fine play going down across the foul line and up against the railing. Mike Witt, even in the game now, 2-2. Two -two. In there. Two runs, five hits, one error for Baltimore. Two runs, two hits, no error for the Angels. count. You know the base on balls was a trademark for the Angels last year. They received the most walks in the majors and allowed the fewest in the division and wouldn't you know it was a couple of walks in the fourth inning that got him back in the ball game. And there's ball four to Rick Burleson. The first game today down in the Astrodome Jamie Moyer held off Nolan Ryan and the Astros two to one and the key was the home run by Ryan Sandberg in the sixth inning. DePino got the save and of course he used to pitch for Houston. He had to get Dickie Fawn for the last out. We've got a good combination going Wiggins and Burleson. Wiggins has lined out and grounded out. He has struck out 10 percent of the time which makes him a good man to put a play on. Makes a strike. Witt's been using the curveball very effectively to Wiggins and the last time was a fastball after showing him nothing but breaking stuff. You can see how he's bearing down taking a look at his uh, coach Jimmy Williams at third base. Wiggins followed by Jim Dwyer a strike on the corner 0 oh and 2 to Allen Mike Witt trying for his sixth win he's lost two he is three and one at home out of first and down the line so it's still 0 and 2 in looking at the Orioles trying to get something going last year they had an incredible collapse when you think about it on the 5th of August last year Baltimore was only two and a half games out of first place I mean they were right on the Red Sox heels and would you believe from the 5th of August to the end of the year Baltimore won only 14 games the rest of the year a drive towards right center field. Devon White moving over. So Burleson back to first. A reminder this telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. So one down and Jim Dwyer coming up. Jimmy Williams may be hanging out a sign from the third base coaching box. 
And here's Dwyer who grounded out in single. He's one of those guys that can handle a bat with good power, according to Ripken. So you can expect anything, although you wouldn't look for pearls in the run, but who knows these days? Well, Dwyer homered last night. He's hit four in his last eight games where they've let him start. Burleson at first, one out in the fifth, a 2 2 tie. He's got a nice gap between first and second. Dwyer can pull the ball. A lot of things going on. The Baltimore books are way out of balance, especially in the stolen base department. They have only stolen 15 and they've been caught 14, so that's awful. And worse than that, They've only stolen 15, and the opposition has stolen 35. So they've had a lot of trouble if they're fighting teams with speed. That's one of the things he was talking about, Benny. He, just, he said, we cannot manufacture runs. No. And then, boy, that's tough if you have to wait for somebody to hit it out. Although that's what they've been getting with 55 home runs to lead the majors. Ball, no strikes. There goes the runner, and it's fouled away. See, he's got a hit and run combination up there. We mentioned, and what? And I like uh, Cal Ripken, the manager. And you have to keep saying that because of the, the, the kid at shortstop. I like his theory. He says I don't want him to just poke the ball like Wire did. I want him to drive the ball. I don't want him to just give up a time at bat because I put a play on. In the second inning, Murray singled, and after the inning was over. Cal was having a lengthy conversation with Frank Robinson. We were trying to read his lips, and he was talking about somebody and not driving the ball. There's one that's driven, but Daryl Miller is there to handle it. And back to first goes Burleson. Still with two out. Here's Ripkin, the shortstop, who grounded out and doubled. The double ignited the fourth inning for two runs. As we mentioned, Cal Ripken Jr. with his remarkable string, not just of consecutive games, but of innings. Last year, his batting average really tailed off against right-hand pitching. Last year, Cal Ripken hit 360 against left-hand pitchers, but only... 255 against righties, a hundred point fall off. That's uh, that's severe. Mm. In there. Different managers, you well know, then have a way of making out their lineups. They just don't go from the top and work down. They'll put the guys in for sure. It's pretty nice for Cal Ripken Sr. to put down Ripken and Murray and then work around those two. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll start with these two, and then we'll see. Yeah, that's a pretty good start. Of course, for Ripken to get that double in the fourth inning, that's no news because... For the last four years, Cal Sr. has seen Cal Jr. lead the American League in extra base hits. Two-two tie with two out in the fifth inning. Two strikes. Mike Witt trying to really help the Angels. He can help them a lot of ways, not just by winning, but by going the distance and giving a tattered pitching staff a day off. High fly ball back of first down the line. McLemore coming across the chalk, but it's back into the crowd just behind the tarp roller. Still one and two to Cal Ripken. So back to first base goes Rick Burleson. In talking about Witt and his contributions to the Angel pitching core, most of the time he'll get into the seventh inning. It's 
Speaking of that, I don't think we'll see Donnie Moore if they do because of a uh, little arm miseries that he's got. All right, he pitched last night, Vice pitched last night, so they really need a, a long outing from Witt. Line drive the other way, foul. In watching Witt, and we mentioned that a minute ago, that base runners do not do much running against him. While he was pitching, only five men succeeded stealing a base last year. And of course, he's operating right now against a team that doesn't run anyway. Boone didn't like where that last pitch was because Ripken really hit it hard. And even though you give a location with the signal that you're flashing, Boone wanted to make sure they were together as to how they're trying to pitch Ripken. Burleson at first, held on by Joyner. Foul the other way. The Ripken keeps hacking away. This Baltimore club has a unique thing going too, Vin. Frank Robinson keeps a book on when they think a fella's going to hit a home run. Like last night, there were eight players predicted Murray's home run. And then the one that uh, Dwyer hit, only two guys were on it. But Robinson keeps a book, a little black book that he's got in his pocket to see who's going to win this derby. Well, <laughs> one and two the count. And another foul ball. So, I, the reason I noticed it, last night I'm watching the game, Murray hits a home run, they all went up and gave uh, Robinson high fives. And I said, what was that all about? I said, that was all the guys that predicted he was going to hit the home run. Tell you, ball clubs have different ways of breaking the mood. The Cleveland Indians with the Hawaii 5-0 business, and these guys with this thing. Mm -hmm. It's more than just pitching and catching a ball. One and two the count to Cal Ripken. Witt trying to freeze the runner. That's just outside. Two and two. Man, that's one of those. If you're hitting 210, I think you're heading back to the dugout. That's one of those reputation balls. Yeah, I'm sure the umpires try not to. But there's no way they can keep from it. No, if you're a, you're an acknowledged solid hitter, and pretty hard to call you out on a borderline pitch. And my own experience, when I would ask about a pitch like this, how would you know if it was a strike? Yeah. They never said that to the big hitters. Of course, you, you're really on the horns of the dilemma when the hitter is a great hitter and his knowledge, but the pitcher is a control pitcher. Right. Just inside. The he's pitching Ripken tough. Of course, everybody in the ballpark, and no doubt everyone watching, knows who the next hitter is after Ripken. The Colossus of Rhodes, better known as Eddie Murray. Two two, top of the fifth, two out. to go now on a full count. High fly ball to center. Pettis is there. So they leave Burleson and at the end of four and a half innings Baltimore to California to a walk in the park for the first three innings and boy what a struggle last inning and McGregor set sail for the fifth. A one hopper at third. Nice play by Knight to stay with it and get him. Whoa. He was playing in on the grass to protect against the bunt, and he had to protect his life with that one. Look where he was playing and moving in, and here it comes. And he was in front of it. He didn't just kind of flag it, give it that old leg grab. It was quite a play. Well, with one away, nice play by Ray Knight, and Brian Downing will be the batter. Downing grounded to third and flied to center. The bench is really giving it to Knight. Slow freight, high, ball one, one and all. In the old days when that would happen, the guy would always holler, well, you keep playing like that, you'll never eat corn on the cob. <laughs> <laughs> high fly ball to left field, and it's carrying. Sheets going back on the track at the wall. So Brian Downing, a long out to left, two down. With Baltimore hitting home runs, it's also interesting to note the Angels are not hitting home runs. In the last week, the Angels have
have been out homered 11 to 2. And the two home runs they hit, hit by the same man, Mark Ryle. And it's head shaking time for Downing. He thought he hit it out. So McGregor with two down, working on Wally Joyner, who flied to center and popped a third. And that's it over the head of Murray and into right field for a base hit. Dwyer up with the ball and Joyner holding. He tomahawked that one. That looked like it was out of the strike zone. He just went up after it. That was a big roundhouse thing, and he wasn't going to let it get by. So Wally Joyner keeps the inning alive with a single that makes the play by Ray Knight that much more important. And here is Devon White. Hit back to the box on a good play by McGregor and singled up the middle. Stole second and scored when the pickoff throw hit him. He is hit in eight straight. One and all to Devon White. With the eight game streak, that's the longest of his young career. He had a seven game streak back in April. Two and all. I'll tell you, with his speed, he's going to put together some streaks. Oh, he's he's going to be something. In there. Wally Joyner at first with two out. White trying to time that slow curve. He has eight home runs this year. Seven of the eight. He hit left handed. throws a curveball that looks like it will die of exhaustion on the way to the plate and this is one of them look at this thing you talk about the needle hitting empty it's not the kind of a curveball that really bites and comes in and is digging as it's coming towards you it just kind of unfolds as it comes there it looks like he's throwing out the first pitch of the game really <laughs> three and two the count he's been a great pitcher now he is really a finesse pitcher. We're 2-2, bottom of the fifth inning. Now back. You know, when you see a fellow like this, you say, well, give me a bat. It's not that simple because pitching, simply stated, I guess, would be keeping the hitter off stride, which he does. And as some managers say, how tough could it be to pitch? You just give him the pitch that he's not looking for. Sure. Yeah, sure. Easy. Handed by Ripken, threw him out on a close play. Boy, if he's left-handed at the plate, he beats that. Mm. So it's still 2-2. Here's another edition of Characters of the Game. I was just thinking the difference if Scotty McGregor, let's say, goes seven with the slow curve and the change, and then suddenly a Kenny Dixon comes in throwing smoke. It must be a little tough for the hitters to adjust after being lulled for a seven inning. No question about it. I mean, that's always the tough thing, and especially, well, if it doesn't mean a hitter you don't have, it, a pinch hitter, you know, it would even make it tough on him. You know what it would be like, Ben? It's like when you have two knuckleballers and a mm -hmm. fastballer. Yeah. Uh, and the way McGregor's throwing, how are you ever going to time it? In fact, they say that is one of the secrets of the way Pete Rose has been managing the Reds, the different type of relief pitcher that he'll use. You never see the same pitcher more than an inning or so. And no one gets the same look at that hit pitcher twice. Scotty McGregor has pitched the Orioles through five against Mike Wood. He's even 2-2. Now in the sixth inning, Eddie Murray, Fred Lynn, and Ray Knight. Eddie Murray singled a right in the second inning. They pitched to him with first base open in the fourth, and he had a scoring fly ball. Fouls this one away. 0-1. You know, when you watch him, McGregor, just a 
throw that one point we were talking about. But look at those home runs for switch hitters first. And of course, back to back games this year, Eddie Murray did home runs from each side of the plate in back to back games. He has done it eight times in his career. The greatest home run hitter as a switch hitter hitting home runs from each side of the plate in the same game. Mickey Mantle did it ten times. Well, Eddie is on his heels now. He's done it eight. Little dribbler foul and the count one and two. Just to finish that thought, Ben. There really are three strike zones when you stop to think about it. There's the pitcher strike zone, the umpire strike zone, and your strike zone. And the mm -hmm. pitcher strike zone, it's, it's the pitch he likes to throw that he feels most confident with. And as a hitter, you try to figure that out. With McGregor, changing speeds makes it doubly tough. And he hits a high fly ball to left field. Daryl Miller is there. Let's go to New York now and get a sports update and visit Bill McAtee. All right, Vin, well, the Preakness is over and Ali Sheba is the winner. So now Ali Sheba is in a position to become the first Triple Crown winner since affirmed in 1978. Like the Derby, bet twice was second. Crypto Clearance finished third. Ali Sheba paid $6. My horse in the pool, Harriman, is still racing. Back to Vin. <laughs> okay. High fly ball to left field and Daryl Miller going back to the track at the wall. Gone. Home run the other way by Fred Lynn. So Freddie Lynn, the pride of USC, comes home to break the 2-2 tie. He had a home run last night. He is hit in nine straight and he has a single and a home run today. For the Orioles, they now have hit 28 home runs in their last nine games. The 1977 Red Sox hit 29 in eight games and 30 in nine games. It didn't look like he really drove that ball either, but it just carried and carried. It more credence to it. is the ball souped up or not. And here's Ray Knight, ball one. I like Bobby Ojeda's... Uh, explanation of it souped up he said they must have two different shifts in Haiti yeah. working on those baseballs right. <laughs> one of them hates pitchers and one of them likes pitchers of course for Freddie Lynn he's hit as many as 23 home runs three years in a row so he is a home run hitter pop fly to McLemore two down Boy, that's something 56 home runs to lead the major leagues and they have just exploded Remember the Red Sox had a stretch in 1977 where they hit 30 home runs in nine games and went on to lead the majors with 213. Well this crew could surpass that. And Nevada Terry Kennedy grounded out and singled he's one for two. Line drive base hit. So Kennedy is two for three. The Witt has allowed seven hits and three runs, and Larry Sheets will be the batter. Sheets flied to right, grounded to second. A remarkable statistic. If they keep it up, you know how many home runs Baltimore would hit if they kept it up? 255, which would be a record. You know what that is? That's projected potential. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's what right. that is. That's a new category. Election headquarters projects <laughs> Baltimore crab cakes and 255. <laughs> Hot Ground ball to the right side to Mark McLemore. Bad hop is on throw. Got him. One run, two hits. Lynn's home run breaks the tie. It's 3 2 Baltimore. Mark McLemore wrestling that bad hop as it hit him high off the right shoulder. He never quit, and Larry Sheets is not your 60-yard dash man anyway. A reminder tomorrow, an NBC Sports special headlining the day, Cannonball, one lap of America, takes to the open road for America's longest endurance rally. That's tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And Sports World takes a step back. Your favorite sports legends return at the Veteran Superstars.
Among those, you'll see Walt Frazier, Joe Torrey, former Dallas Cowboy wide receiver Drew Pearson. Big day tomorrow. Jack Howell, who is finishing up for Doug DeSensei. If you weren't with us, DeSensei chasing a foul ball ran into the railing of the photographer's well, and the railing got him in the Adam's apple, and he gamely stayed in, but had to come out. Howell batted for him in the fourth inning, walked and scored a run. Jack coming back from a bad back. 0 oh and 2. Then you talk about the veteran superstars. I don't know why it triggered the thought, but I'd like someday to sit and watch a ball game with a guy I visited with yesterday, King Carl Hubble, mm. who's back in Mesa watching every game. One and two. Big slow curve ball hit the dead center. Lynn going back. The ball is carrying, but he's on the track to make the catch. In case you might have joined us a little late, this is what happened to poor Doug DeSensei. Reaching with his right hand and bam! right in the throat and we never thought that he would even try to continue he came back in for the last out in the fourth inning and then he couldn't stand it and Jack Howell has taken over here's Daryl Miller sacrificed and walked fouled away on one that was really good coverage on that ball that Howell hit because the limb it was a classic way to make the play. He really took a good look as, a, as to how far he was in that wall and the warning track. And then he went back and made the play. Yeah. He knew exactly where he was. Fouled away. Down the right field line out of play on the count 0 and 2. Just a footnote on old Hub. He's feeling fine and talking baseball and sitting there. He says, watch every game. He's King something. Carl. King Carl. Busted bat blooper right to Eddie Murray. So that will take care of Miller and his bat. Two down in the sixth inning. And the batter will be Dick Schofield. See those orange, orange uh, wristbands that Murray has? Before the game, they gave him a bunch of them, and they have uh, embroidered uh, his own image on there. But now there's a message. Say no to drugs. Oh, that's great. Terrific. In fact, they had a pregame presentation here. Say no to drugs. There was a school large meeting at the Rose Bowl about say no to drugs. I'll tell you one thing, kids. If you have any idea, you find out one person it's helped. And you'll find out the millions it's ruined. Boy, and it was a great, wasn't it in the news in Atlanta, that big rally they had, all those youngsters. Say no to drugs. Just say no. Schofield 0 for 2 on fly balls to right field. 2 and 1 to count. Scotty McGregor. Boy, he is something to watch. Fastball and another fly ball to shallow right. Dwyer coming up, and this one's going to fall. So three times Schofield has hit lazy fly balls, and this one falls in. In the old story, it looked like a line drive in the box score. That will bring up Bob Boone, who had the single to center in the fourth inning to tie up the game for California. Boone popped up in the second inning. He's hit in seven straight. That's about the way you hit McGregor, is to swing as hard as he throws. Mm -hmm. and that's what Boone did the last time, just put the ball in play. You catch him, you don't need a sponge. There's the fastball, and that's high, ball one. Boone with his seven-game hitting streak. That's the longest since 85. He had a nine-game streak two years ago. It's 3-2 to two Baltimore. The difference in the game, as you might imagine, a home run. This one hit by Fred Lynn. Baltimore had a, a tough trip. They played a home game Thursday night, and then after the night game, flew all night to get here to play yesterday. And they lost in extra innings. We're in the sixth. Three 
to Baltimore. got a little excited. <laughs> Holding at first Dick Schofield. Two balls and no strikes to Bob Boone. Out away. He was out in front. He kind of cued that thing to the backstop. I tell you, when Cuellar was here and Gregor and Gene Spees, boy, that had to be something. Mm. Gave up 35 home runs last year. Whenever he missed, he was in trouble. Breaking ball. Oh, what a beauty. And McGregor lost the count. That's rare. McGregor thought that was strike three. Yes, and when did. a pitcher loses the count, he's really in trouble. So Scotty's a little embarrassed. The pen active back of him. Two and two to Bob Boone. Field, representing the tying run at first with two out. And there he goes, the pick off to Murray, who angles the throw down and got him. Ripken handling it. Murray moving to the inside portion of the infield so the runner wouldn't be in his way. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. When he gets the sign, and that's what really helps him pick off the runner, looking at the plate, looks at, goes whoop right there, goes up, and when Schofield saw that right leg go up. That's when he broke. And then Murray, he doesn't want that runner between him and the ball. And look how far on the inside Schofield was, and yet Second Murray baseman. making sure he didn't hit him. That was a good play all the way around. Yeah, I've seen so many first basemen who hate to even try to make that play because the runner is between them and the man they're throwing the ball to. But Murray was so quick to pivot his body, get way into the infield, and he made a difficult play seem easier enough. Meanwhile, the Lakers jump out in front over Seattle. 92-87, that's a final. We have a good one here. It's 3-2 in favor of Baltimore in the seventh inning. Rick Burleson followed by Alan Wiggins and then Jim Dwyer. Ground ball at third, short hopped and backhanded by Howell. Oh, did he handle that ball well? He's a good player, Ben. Wow. I think that uh, Mock's description of him is just perfect. He's a blue-collar player. He comes, he'll do whatever you ask him to do. Play the outfield, now he backhands this short hop. Good, strong throw. Hadn't played in a week, and when he did play, he was playing the outfield. And now gets a tough chance at third and handles it easily. Here's Wiggins. Lined out, grounded out, flied out. All right. Wiggins followed by the left-hand hitting Jim Dwyer. Surprise how is moved closer, protecting against the bunt. Wiggins can do that. <clears throat> Wiggins with overpowering speed, but of course it's the old story. He has to get on base first. But anybody who stole as many as 120 bases in the minor leagues has to catch your eye. One thing about Wiggins, don't look for a home run. He has not hit a home run since 1984. Either the majors or the minors. And he has one home run this year. As he hits that one to left field, and that's caught. So two down in the seventh inning, and Jim Dwyer coming up. Grounded out, singled, and flied to left. Well, with 
Doug DeSensei out today on a freak injury. Sid Fernandez of the New York Mets hurt his knee last night. Although Roger McDowell returned and pitched very, very well in relief. Eric Davis landed heavily on his shoulder. He's going to be out for a couple of days. The specter of injury looming over everybody, of course, and we're just into May. High drive into deep right field, and that baby is gone back in the bullpen. And so Jim Wire, who hit a home run last night, hits one out tonight, and for Dwyer, his fifth home run of the year. That's the second home run for Baltimore today. That means they've hit 29 home runs in their last nine games. And they've hit 57 home runs to lead the league and lead the majors. He knew it too. The minute he hit it, he wanted to see it himself. For Jim Dwyer, he makes it four to two. And that happened to be the 100th home run allowed by Mike Witt. That's hit foul off first out of play. So Jim Dwyer, two for four today. And two home runs in two days here. One ball, one strike. Jim Dwyer is a fellow who's been around a long time. It's hard to believe he's had 15 years in the big leagues. 15. He originally came up in the St. Louis Cardinal organization. Played with a lot of teams, but a 15-year career is outstanding. Three and one. When you start to think pension, the way it is set up now, that oh, really is a lot. He first came up as you see Chuck Finley throwing in the angel pen. Dwyer first came up in 73. That's almost what Sid Fernandez did. Started to deliver the ball and then just kind of fell off the mound. Although Witt stopped right there. We're talking about Fernandez's injury. Uh, he started to pitch and then kind of fell off and boom. Maybe a sprained knee. Well, that's all Mark would need. <laughs> In there. Two and two. So Mike Wood is down four to two here in the seventh inning. Home runs by Fred Lynn and Jim Dwyer have broken the 2 2 tie. And of course, the Angels have been unable to do anything really against Scotty McGregor except for a couple of walks. And on deck, and I'm sure Mark feels like every manager in the American League that Murray keeps batting out of turn. Whoa! was a haircut. So Ripken hits a BB by Mike Wood and Eddie Murray's coming up again. Eddie Murray. You know, that's one thing that pitchers say that they know the ball is juiced up the way it's coming back at them. Now, you're 60 feet, 6 inches when you start, but he's about 55 feet, and look at that ball, almost like it came off an aluminum bat, and Witt at 6'7", he has to do a pretty good job of ducking. And then after... One coming that close, you now look at such a power hitter like Murray. Eddie Murray singled to right in the second inning, had a scoring fly ball in the fourth, and flied to left in the sixth. Eddie with 28 RBIs, most of them picked up as a left-handed batter. Four to two Baltimore in the seventh inning. Line drive base hit to right field. Ripken is around second and holding. So remember, Burleson was out on a good play by Howell. Then Wiggins lined out to left, and suddenly Dwyer a home run, Ripken a single, Murray a single. And here comes Fred Lynn again. Ten hits for Baltimore, and eight of them amongst the numbers two, three, and four hitters. And Marcel Latchman going out to the mound. Lynn has a single and a home run, and I think they want Finley to come in and pitch to him. So Mike Witt, the ace of a staff that is 
in tatters right now is going to go out and losing. And the left hand of Finley coming in, Willie Frazier, the right hander whom we saw pitch so well in Fenway Park, will pitch tomorrow. We'll be back right after this. With all those numbers up there, I think the one that really jumps out at you, Mike Witt, goes six and two thirds and strikes out one. And that one strikeout was in the second inning. He gave it his best shot, and his manager gives him a little nice try, buddy. Chuck Finley trying to relive a day last August where he came in in relief and worked three innings at Memorial Stadium against Baltimore and struck out six. Finley also going against Baltimore last year. He allowed only two home runs in 25 appearances and he's up against a home run hitting ball club indeed now. You can see the fall off with Lynn against left handers. Two for three. Started in breaking ball, ball one. Ripken at second, Murray at first. Four to two Baltimore. Two down in the seventh. So he's behind two and all. Oh. When the Angels bat in the bottom of the seventh, they have Bob Boone, Gary Pettis, Mark McLemore against Scotty McGregor. Good pitch, good swing. Good spot. High tight fastball. Two and one to Fred Lynn. Another left handed down in the pen, Gary Lucas. Three and one to count. A kiss of death, huh? Well, three one count. <laughs> yeah, and this come in. Oh. <laughs> three and one. And ball four. So Fred Lynn draws the base on balls to load the bases and bring up Ray Knight. Interesting that Ray Knight should wind up playing third base for Baltimore. He and his wife Nancy, Nancy Lopez Knight, have two children. They have da two daughters, Ashley Marie and Aaron. And Ray has a son from a previous marriage named Brooks, who was named after, uh huh, Brooks Robinson. That's right. Now, if you just said Foster Brooks, you'd really have a story. You'd have a real story. <laughs> If you're thinking slam with Ray Knight up there, he's had four grand slam in his career, but he hasn't hit one since 1980. Ripken, Murray, and Lynn out on the bases. Right. All into the count. Four runs, ten hits for Baltimore. Two runs, four hits for California. Deck Terry Kennedy. One and two. Knight lined out to left, flied to left, popped up. He has a little five game hitting streak. In on the hands, and that takes care of Ray Knight. The 19th time this year, the O's have left the bases loaded, and here's another seventh inning stretch. Here's one of those interesting plays. Now, watch what happens here when uh, Knight misses the ball. Boone drops it. Doesn't throw the first, makes a good play. He steps on home plate for the force out since the bases were loaded. But many times, as a catcher, you better tell that umpire what you're doing, or you're liable to be in a little bit of trouble. Well, Boone has been around long enough to hold a seminar. A reminder, next week, you can begin the 87 baseball season coverage right here at NBC with Major League Baseball, an inside look with host Marv Albert. And then you'll see the Dodgers, Mets, or the Braves and the Cubs. 
Bob Boone popped up and singled his base hit in the fourth inning drove in the tying run. He was at the plate when Dick Schofield was picked off in the second inning in the uh, sixth inning and was nailed at second base. That's right. And Boone didn't like that one. Scott McGregor allowed two runs four hits. When he allowed the two runs he just lost the strike zone. He had back to back walks to Howell and Miller and then his own error contributed. Two and one. You got a beach ball out in right field. You can see Drew Coble holding up his hands. When Drew Coble holds up his hand, you take a second look at the second base umpire while we look at Freddie Lynn retrieving the ball. Drew Coble, the second base umpire, as the plate umpire in a game in Seattle had a foul ball catch him on the hand. He taped and doesn't miss a day. You'll get those hands behind the catcher next time. It's always the danger. The good thing is, for his prestige, it is his left hand and not his right. 2 1 pitch foul back. The reason we say that, I remember years ago, old umpires telling me you never wanted to have a foul ball hit your right hand because your right hand carries the indicator, and if it hit your right hand, it meant that you were actually calling the pitch too soon. So for Coble, that's more than a red badge of courage. It's a sign that he was doing a good job behind the plate. Thank you, Mr. Coble. <laughs> Foul ball. You could see on that center field shot how Denkinger getting behind the catcher, although he was a bit exposed on that pitch, but his, head, his hands, most of them were behind the uh, catcher Kennedy. Watch two the and position. Two. Well, he's wide open now. Mm. And that's up the middle. Base hit for Boone. He's two for three. So a couple of crafty veterans, Scotty McGregor on the mound and Bob Boone at the plate. And Boone just nudging the ball up the middle. And the batter will be Gary Pettis. Pettis has lined out and struck out, and those are McGregor's numbers. Of course, he doesn't figure to strike out more than a couple. His high in strikeouts this year, five. He doesn't give up many ground balls, uh, McGregor doesn't. Most of them are fly ball outs because he changes speeds, get the, uh, the batters to pop that ball up. And you know that's kind of dangerous, especially here in Anaheim in the daytime where the ball travels very well. Gary Pettis, in his career, has hit two home runs against left-hand pitching. Both of them against Mike Mason of the Texas Rangers. And within six days of each other. Mike Mason of Texas, Ken Dixon of Baltimore. The Mason-Dixon line, if you check on the game in Las Vegas. Line drive, base hit into left field. And with two on and nobody out, Mark McLemore coming up. And now Scotty McGregor is in a little trouble, and Gene Mark will send in a pinch runner for Bob Boone. And the runner will be Rupert Jones. Ripken is going out to the mound and let's see if he's bringing a hook with him. He sent Mark Wiley, his pitching coach, out. But now he has a left-hander and a right-hander in the bullpen. And the right-hander is Ken Dixon. And you have McLemore, a switch hitter, then downing a right-hander and Joyner, a left-hander. And that will be all. Scott McGregor, back-to-back -back singles in the seventh, and the storm signals are up. We'll be back. Well, the memories were waiting in the head of Scott McGregor, a kid who grew up in the El Segundo area. He wanted this one badly. He went to high school with George Brett, and he gave it his best shot. What he's particularly annoyed about, he was leading four to two, and he first showed signs of being visibly upset when Bob Boone got the hit. Now he goes out knowing that the runners on base belong to him. He could have nothing to do with the game. He can't lose it, of course, but it could be an effort down the drain after six strong innings. 
and Ken Dixon. We were talking before about Ken Dixon pitching against Mike Mason and the Dixon, the Mason Dixon line. For historians, it was interesting to note that Dixon started against Mason April the 9th this year, which was the anniversary of the end of the Civil War. Mason Dixon. All right. All right, baby. Let's hear it. Once once a week, you lay one on me. <laughs> Last week was Goldwater. Today, it's Mason Dixon line. Well, it was 122 years ago. And there was Mason versus Dixon. All and right. Jimmy Reese was there. 4-2 <laughs> in favor of the Orioles. Mark McLemore, a switch hitter. So he'll turn around now and go left-handed against Dixon. up grounded hard to third Ray Knight made a good play to stay with it in the fifth inning so Ken Dixon from starter to reliever hard thrower and they've got the runner hung up in the throw at third and Rupert Jones in a jam Knight throws down to Ripken the collision but Cal holds on to the ball and is that ever embarrassing to be sent in the front runner and of course that takes the burden off Scotty McGregor Kennedy Kennedy's ready to throw the second and he holds up wisely and now he's got him trapped unless the infielders handle it he cut him off he makes him go to the base he came from and Rupert is really in no man's land oh. two five six if you're scoring and for Rupert Jones, he's probably looking for a place to hide. That'll happen so often in that kind of a situation because you're trying to get a jump on the bunt. And, and when McLemore put that bat up and drew it back, Ben, that was the key. It, it trapped him. Two balls and no strikes. But you can imagine the frustrations in the Angel dugout and some relief in the Baltimore dugout. Manager standing alone. Well, McGregor is still leading 4 2, and now there's only one runner that belongs to him. 2 0. Oh. On the corner. 2 and 1. I was reading about him. A really strange thing. We were showing uh, Mike Heath with the mask on the on the pitch in the dirt. Two and two. In a minor league game, a fellow was called in in relief, got the win, never faced a batter, never made a pitch, and didn't pick a runner off. What happened was the previous play, a runner had tagged up and scored, and they brought him in. And then he appealed, threw over to third, and the runner was called out for leaving third too soon. And he got the win. <laughs> didn't face a pitcher, didn't do anything. Well, Dixon isn't in that spot, but he's trying to keep the Angels away. It's 4-2 Baltimore, bottom of the seventh. The Angels are not singing to resurrect Benny Goodman. Keep pointing to his left shoulder as if to say to Dixon, don't open up too soon. Stay with it. There goes the runner, and it's fouled away. So Pettis was going, and McLemore hit the ball inside out. Foul back onto the screen, and it's still 3-2. In the inning, Boone single, Pettis single. That was all for McGregor. Jones came in to run for Boone. Dixon came in to pitch for McGregor, and Jones was picked off. Trying to get a jump on a bun play, which never materialized. There goes Pettis on ball four. And of course, for the Angels, they think of what might have been. They could easily have the bases loaded and nobody out. Instead, they have first and second with one out. The big difference now is, is the decision. Scott McGregor can only win or have nothing to do with it, but he can only win 
and he still has a chance to win. Kennedy really taking charge, making sure. It's always basic plays you talk about. I'm sure he went out there and said, look, if the ball's hit back to you, know what you're going to do with it, know who's going to cover, and get it to him. Remind him the number of outs and who's batting, and let's go to work. Well, here's a guy who likes to go to work, as those numbers tell you, with men in scoring position. Brian Downing, 0 for 3 today. Right. Downing grounded hard to third, flied to center, and flied to left. 4 to 2, Baltimore. Two on, one out. Right. 0 and 2. Dixon has a unique way of coming set. He never really comes to the belt. He stops right about eye level and then comes down letters away from his body, watching. There. And never really comes set. Fastball hit right at him. He goes to second for one, the first double play. And Scotty McGregor is still alive to get the win, thanks to the pickoff and the double play. And at the end of seven, Baltimore four, California two. Good play by Ken Dixon. Yes, sir. Remember, Kennedy had just gone out to remind him. I think this is one of the things to remind him. If you get the ball, know who's going to cover because he doesn't hesitate. He knows his shortstop Ripken is going to come over. And even if that didn't give him that good a throw, but it's a double play. That was a real good play, and I like this, Ben. Oh, Scotty McGregor is still alive for the win. Of course, he has only one victory this year, and you can understand how he feels about it, getting off the hook there in the seventh inning. The reason I like that is when pitchers get taken out of the game as we looked at Rupert Jones who's in left field and Miller behind the plate he's staying on the bench to see what's happening. Terry Kennedy fouls one away and the count 0 and 1. Kennedy has grounded out single to center and single to right. So Terry two for three with his mom and dad here watching having a good day. 4 2 Baltimore we're in the top of the eighth inning. One and one. It's funny you would even bring up that the picture stays on the old days that was so common now mm -hmm. it's almost a rarity. Yeah. High fly ball to straightaway center Gary Pettis is there. One out in the eighth. And Scotty a little more animated as he talks to Ray Knight. Be nice for the people in Baltimore to see him win a game today because he's 0-4 at home this year. Larry Sheets will give way to Lee Lacey. So Lacey will hit for Sheets against the left-hander Chuck Finley. Lacey, among other things, bothered with a hamstring pull. developed into a fine hitter over the years. He has hit a career average 290 in the American League. He's averaged over 300 the last seven years. And evidently in seeing him coming up now he came off the DL. He had that hamstring pull. He was off from the end of April into early May. So Lee Lacey, one out in the eight. Of course, it's another thing when you look at some of the members of Baltimore, and they take tremendous pride, and well, they should, in the success of the organization over the years. We talked about there, 18 consecutive winning years. But every team's minor league system dries up to a point. So all of a sudden, you see Baltimore trading for a Terry Kennedy, getting a Rick Burleson as a free agent, Signing a Ray Knight as a free agent. Getting Fred Lynn, Lee Lacey. And if you look back to the 83 Orioles, it's kind of shocking to realize all the players who have moved on. Two and one. The names. Dempsey and Dower, Lowenstein, Renicky, Bumbry, Ford, Singleton, Cruz, Hernandez. Boy, the... The truck backed up. <laughs> two and two to Lee Lacey. Gene Mark is seeing fruits of the minor league organization and their fruition as a lot of kids are now coming up 
to play for the Angels. They have gone the other way from the veteran player to the youth. Three and two. One out, eighth inning, 4 2 Baltimore. Mike Witt relieved by Chuck Finley. So Lacey draws the walk. That's the second pass given up by Finley. Rick Burleson. Rick Burleson as Ripken passing along signs to Jimmy Williams who in turn passes them on to the hitter. Maybe. All right. Or he might be doing all that and there's somebody else sitting quietly in the dugout flashing the signs. Quite possible but he's got a combination up there and it's a good thing to do if nothing else to decoy it. Burleson is fouled out walked and robbed of a hit by Howell. Remember that good play Jack made backhanding and short hopping the ball in the seventh inning. Rick over two. Rick given the third base coach a good good chance to give a lot of signs. You know, for a long time Baltimore would come out to California and do well but they are struggling. Here in Anaheim they've lost eight of their last 12 and if you go back to last May the Orioles are having a terrible time when they come to the state of California for that matter the Pacific side of the country they've lost 12 of their last 14 throw to first Lacey back a little bit of that could be attributed to the travel schedule. That was just one of those uh, flip jobs by Boone, not a set play. Many times you'll give a first baseman a sign and it pretty much says, uh, hey, be there. If I get the ball, I'm going to throw it and you get an answer. But this was just a flip. Gary Lucas, another left-hander loosening up. You have a switch hitter, Wiggins, on deck, and then the left-hand hitting Dwyer, just to look ahead. Three and zero to Rick Burleson. So suddenly Finley has walked two in the inning and three in one third of an inning. And now here comes Wiggins. And that's what really runs that manager to the water cooler because hey the guys that he's put on base really not home run threats. And Wiggins isn't either but keep fooling around you got Dwyer Ripken Murray Lynn Knight Kennedy. What really ticks off Mark too and I'm sure he knows because he studies the averages Rick Burleson is hitting about 120 since the middle of April. He just hasn't had any luck at all with the bat. And he has walked twice today. So Gary Lucas is being called in as Marcel Latchman out to the mound to pick up Finley. It is very questionable that we would see Donnie Moore or Dwayne Vice. We'll be back after this. Chuck Finley is really struggling with his control not only today he's now walked 15 batters in 18 innings that's a tough way for a kid left hander to get underway in the big league so he gives way to Gary Lucas and I guess everyone will forever remember the dramatic moment in game five here in Anaheim with the Angels and the Boston Red Sox when Gary Lucas hit Rich Gedman here was a pitcher who had not hit a batter since May of 1982 and he hit Gedman and the whole world changed as far as the American League was concerned. Baltimore trying to change it for more and Alan Wiggins turning around to hit right handed one out two on. Right. Wiggins has lined out and grounded out in a couple of fly balls. Gary Lucas. 0 oh and 1 and he's had a lot of trouble giving up a lot of hits. He's averaging two hits allowed per inning. Fouled away. So because of that with the hits and throw in a few walks and he comes in with an earned run average of almost 13. Gary's a local boy born in Riverside lives in Escondido. And he has Lacey at second, Burleson at first, and one out. Ball one. Darrell Miller behind the plate, taking over for Bob Boone. 
Boy, that's hard. You know, there's a fellow who, who was an outfielder, then a catcher, an outfielder, played the outfield today. Now he's finishing up the game catching. The only time it's easy is when you go in and negotiate a contract. Yeah. One and two. Two and two. Especially with the 24-man roster, he becomes very valuable to be able to come in from left field and go behind the plate. Oh, I should say. So Daryl Miller started the game in left. Now behind the plate for Boone. Lacey and Burleson with one out, two and two the count. Fouled away. Gary Lucas, you might remember, came up in the San Diego organization. He pitched with the Padres, oh, from 80 through 83. Then he went over to Montreal for a couple of years and eventually acquired from Montreal. And the O's are watching him, leading 4 2. A shot on the ground to McLemore, quickly to Schofield. Too late to join her. That was just sure speed that made that play because it was handled perfectly on both ends. Schofield came flying across that bag. The infield slowed the ball down a bit. The grass is high. McLemore gives Schofield a good ball to handle. No way the runner could get to him, but Wiggins' great speed makes it. And so, <laughs> McGregor, McGregor doing the cheerleading. Yeah. He's still on that bench. Give you an idea. If McGregor does win the game, he will have beaten the Angels 20 times in his career. Most of victories against any team in the American League. So they'll keep an eye on Wiggins at first. Wiggins has stolen seven out of 11. Dwyer grounded out and single flied out and homered. Getting the home run by McGuire, and for all those McGuires, we've got the spelling right this time. Beat Oakland in the eighth inning. It's Oakland 10, Toronto 3. Bell, Barfield, and Tettelin also chimed in. Wiggins and Lacey, Lacey at third. Strikes. Wiggins at first base really gets himself a pretty good lead. I think it's a matter if he wants to go or do you want to hold that gap between first and second because you got the big hitters up. You certainly don't want to get thrown out. You better be about 99% sure you can make it. I know he's not coming, but I was watching Lee Lacey at third. He was really coming down the line on Lucas. And it reminded me that Lacey stole home last year against Oakland. Of course, I'm not saying he's going to try and steal home, not with a left-hand hitter at the plate. Wire taking a look to see if they got the green light here at 3-0. You would think with Ripken coming up next that he'd be taken, but that book they talk about has been thrown out a long time ago. 3-0 on the corner, 3-1. 3-1 to Jim Dwyer, Alan Wiggins at first, Lee Lacey at third, 4-2 Baltimore, top of the eighth. The Angels will have Joyner, White, and Howell in the bottom of the eighth. and Joyner is reminding Lucas that he is not going to be on the bag. The third base coach reminding Lacey, hey, now, if it's a ball, you stay right here. Naturally, Lucas would like to get Dwyer and end the inning rather than look at Cal Ripken, who's due up next. So this would be the best he has. Wiggins 
Jones goes. Lacey blocks, and it's strike three at the plate. So Baltimore leaves two birds out there on a limb, and it's still 4-2 Baltimore. That was a great buildup for nothing to happen. Three and two, watching Wiggins take off for second. Lacey charging down the line, putting a big bluff, and the hitter then strikes out. Yeah, you wonder why was Lacey doing that, but uh, I guess he thought he'd rattle somebody, but then if you talk to Lacey, you know, he'll do things like that. Oh, yeah, he was really putting on the effort. Didn't you say you've seen a guy in a similar situation kind of go too far? I was with the Pittsburgh club and Tony Bartirome as we look at the changes here. Bartirome thought it was ball four, and he started walking in, thinking he was forced in and got three steps from home plate before Larry Jansen threw the Westrom and they tagged him out. But he almost made it. Meanwhile, Jim Dwyer moves over to left. Lee Lacey stays in the game and he's in right. And we'll go to the bottom of the eighth inning. Wally Joyner, Devon White, and Jack Howell. And Jack O'Connor who was not on the Baltimore roster in spring training. He appeared in last night's game. And Jack is a Californian, at least he was born in the state. He lives in Florida now. And Jack O'Connor coming in to try and get some outs. So Dixon worked briefly last night. Ken pitched a one hitter, and it was Devon White who singled in the winning run in the 10th. Then Dixon came in today and pitched to two hitters, walked one and got Downing to hit into the double play, and Dixon gives way to Jack O'Connor. Naturally, when you look at the Angels do up in the eighth, Joyner left-handed, White a switch hitter, and Howell left-handed, you can understand the move. Wally Joyner, fly to center, pop to third, single to right. The Angels, as we mentioned, see left-handers McGregor and O'Connor today. They saw Bell last night. They'll see Flanagan tomorrow. You can bet they'll see, if possible, Tommy John, Dennis Rasmussen, and maybe even Ron Guidry when they play the Yankees. They'll probably get Jimmy Key at Toronto. It is a left-handed move put on California. On deck, Devon White. Three and one. High fly ball into shallow left center. Lynn coming up for it. One away. Devon White hit back to the box, singled and grounded out. And of course, for California, they lost the right-handed bat of Doug DeSensei. They lost the right-handed bat of George Hendrick when he was hit by Gene Nelson and mashed a hand. Consequently, struggling against left-handed. So the key for California is to get George Hendrick back as soon as possible and hope for a speedy return of Doug DeSensei. Another left-hand hitter, Jack Howell, on deck. One and one. One and two to Devon White. Six three two ten. Foul ball or first out of play. Bottom of the eighth inning. It was two nothing Baltimore. The Angels came back to tie and on home runs by Lynn and Dwyer. Baltimore leads four two. Fouled away. That got thinking her. Sure did. Hmm. Where does it get? Like a 
breaking ball inside. Rattled around inside the shins, it looks like. Yeah, it, it came up out of the ground. I think it struck him somewhere inside the right leg. That's why he lost his balance. It just clipped him. And did you see the catcher grab him, huh? Yeah. Wasn't it nice of Kennedy to do that? What? You think he'll get a strike call? No. No. Well, it's a good idea, though, to be kind to of oh. fire back there. And look, he's even asking about him. Yeah. That had been a player, you know what would have happened. The umpire would have checked the ball. Two and two, the count to Devon White. Four, two, Baltimore, bottom of the eighth. One away. Boy, he almost left at the station on that express. He just got a piece of it. Brian Harvey begins to loosen up. There are a couple of new faces on the scene, Jack O'Connor and Brian Harvey. Hey, he's fouled off some pretty tough pitches. As you see the various new faces come along, it's interesting to think back when Baltimore beat California in 1979 for the championship. The only member of the California team still here is Brian Downing. Come back, they're going to have to break the news. He thought, maybe I'll get away with it if I just keep running. Maybe they'll let me go to first. That's a foul tip. That's a foul tip. <laughs> And Kennedy held it. He thought he was going to get ball four. Maybe. So down goes White. I'll just keep going to first and see what happens. Maybe nobody will notice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I'll make a little turn. Yes. Oh, well, nice try. Two down in the eighth. And Jack Howell finishing up a Doug DeSense. Walked and fly to center, takes a strike. 0 and 1. Going back to that 79 meeting, the members of Baltimore still here Eddie Murray, Mike Flanagan, Scott McGregor, and of course Doug DeSensei was traded from the 79 Baltimore team to the Angels after the 81 season. Shows you the attrition. And Gene Mark trying to catch the golden ring yet again. Down goes Howell, a very quiet inning as Jack O'Connor strikes out two of the three men he looks at. And at the end of eight, 4 2 Baltimore. Dates and time out of the past, kind of a memorable day, particularly for the Baltimore team and Jim Palmer in particular. 22 years ago today, Jim picked up his first and hit a home run as well. And for Brian Harvey, called up from double A. Boy, that's a jump. Brian Harvey, 6 390 pounder. He's 24 years older. He will be in June from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and lives in Sheryls Ford, North Carolina. Ever been to Sheryls Ford? No. <laughs> no, I, I didn't like the pace. It's too fast for him. <laughs> the attendance today, 35,463. 35,463. They have not had very much to cheer about. Baltimore got two in the fourth inning on four hits. Dwyer single, Ripken doubled him to third. Murray's fly ball got Dwyer home. Lynn single picked up Ripken. In the bottom of the fourth, a base hit to White and a walk to Howell. A pickoff play after White had stolen second, hit him, and White scored. And then Howell scored on the single by Bob Boone. But in the sixth inning, Lynn homered. In the seventh inning, Dwyer homered. And it is 4-2 Baltimore in the ninth, and you're up to date. Ripken grounded a short, doubled, singled, and flied out. The double was in the fourth inning and set the stage for the two runs. So Brian Harvey making that big jump from double A. Ground 
foul. Tell you one thing, he's got something to tell the grandchildren. Yep, about pitching to Cal Ripken. He's another one of those pitchers, it looks like, Vin, where they try to get a little extra leverage by really turning their back to the batter. Mm -hmm, kind of curling up. Yeah, tough to pick up that ball. So he gets Ripken, Murray, and Lynn. Great way to break into the big leagues from double A. In there. Hey, what a way to start. Pretty good curveball. You can see him almost turn completely around and just come right over the top of the curveball. And Ripken, I'm sure, first time he's ever seen him. And he'll have an idea the next time. There it is. Look at him. You know, you have to really have been watching baseball a long time, but you see how he moved that ball back to his hip? And this is only for those folks who really can remember those days. There was a pitcher named Vito Tamulus who had a strange delivery, and that's what he would do. He would just kind of tray that ball back to his right hip. Vito Tamulus. Mm, what a name out of the past. Eddie Murray, single to right, had a scoring fly ball, flied to left and single to right. So he's two for three. 2-0. Oh. Well, the guy that used to really turn his back to you, those old fat Freddy. Yeah. Fitz Simmons, remember? And, of course, it's almost like the Johnny Sane how to hold a runner at second yeah. base. So, Brian Harvey strikes out Ripken and now after Murray. 3-0. and oh. Well, what do you think? Would you let Murray have the green light three and all against his kid? Look at him looking at Jimmy to see you put that take sign on now and we're going to have some words. <laughs> three and one. He just didn't like where that yeah. was. But he was ready to trigger his cock. Urbano Lugo loosening up down in the pen for California. Three and one. Whoop. Got a ball up above the shoulders, and he went after it anyway. Saw the fastball, and he was looking for it and couldn't hold back. Three and two, Daddy. On deck, Freddie Lynn, who has hit a home run today. has hit seven home runs in his last eight games. It's about as hot as you can get in the big leagues. And he hits a one hopper. Great stop by McLemore to get him. What a fine play. Mark McLemore slipping and sliding. Got his man. <laughs> Usually when they make a play like that, they're almost content to just lay there, stopping it from going to the outfield, but not McLemore. He comes up firing, and he gets Murray by a couple of steps. Pretty good pitch, low outside, and what a play by McLemore. You know, really, Murray didn't get much of that. He hit it one-handed. Had he hit it with both hands, I don't think McLemore could have made the I play. I agree with you. Yeah. He hit a ball last night, almost broke his bat. I say almost because he hit on the end of the bat and drove it to center field. Hank Peters and I were talking about that. He's very strong, Murray. Oh, is he? Freddie Lynn struck out, singled, homered, and walked. He's hit in nine straight. Meanwhile, Scotty McGregor says, hey, anything I can do to help, guys, if I can just keep you loose, go get me my second win of the year. You can't blame him. He's working on body girl. <laughs> and there's ball four to Lynn. So two walks, a single, and a home run for Fred. And the batter will be Ray Knight. So it's been Witt, Finley, Lucas, and Harvey. And Mike Witt was charged with all four runs. Knight lined to left, flied to left, popped up and struck out. 0 for 4 and fouls it away. 0 and 1. When the Angels come up in the bottom of the ninth inning, they're due to send up 
Darrell Miller, Dick Schofield, and Rupert Jones. And that would be against left-hander Jack O'Connor. Pull to the backstop, and down to second base easily goes Freddie Lynn. I mean, Miller didn't even get a glove on it. Look at Denker wide open, and whoops. You don't see that too often. You at least knock it down. He obviously was crossed up on it because if you know it's a fastball, I don't care how hard they throw it, you can usually knock it down. Well, he just got here, so if he crosses up the catcher, that is certainly understandable. To everybody except the catcher. Yeah. And his family. I remember a pitcher traded to Pittsburgh, and we made a trip and got in there and said, how's everything? You know all the guys. He said, I don't even know all the handshakes. <laughs> <laughs> Fouled away. The high fives, the low fives, the fist to fist. Got them all. They got all new ones now. Yeah, oh yeah. What was that one? Was Ken Jelosi, one of them small guys trying to jump up to Parker and he couldn't reach him? Pete Rose was the funniest thing he ever saw. He kept hitting him <laughs> in the Adams apple or something. <laughs> I saw a piece somewhere. <laughs> One and two, the count to Ray Knight. Two down, ninth inning, four to two, Baltimore. And that one is in the dirt and gets away. And Lynn goes to third. So you have a kid up from double A pitching to an outfielder catcher and we have some troubles. He threw a 55 footer that time. Miller got in front of it in good shape but just to care him. He was in Ooh. front of it him right in the groin. Mm. That's one of those where you talk to the Ooh. pitcher afterwards. Yeah there are better. You know what I was through. thinking about immediately. What? Is he wearing a protective cup. Oh you, you know. Me. The, well I mean he's playing the outfield. I don't for care seven where he's minutes. playing. If he walked in the ballpark he's wearing it. I hope so. Two and two. Go behind that plate without one, and I'm telling you that, that you can go see the doctor between There two have and four. been guys who have done it. Not very long. No. Another one, 55 oh. foot. He's overthrowing it now. So Brian Harvey struggling here in the ninth. The A's have put the Blue Jays away. Haas beating Key. Started off with a three run home run in the first inning by Mark McGuire, and they took it from there. High drive into left field. Rupert Jones back just about to the track and will make the catch for the out. And Brian Harvey has survived the inning, and at the end of eight and a half, Baltimore four, California two. Baseball game of the week has been brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft, cold filtered draft beer. It's as real as it gets. By Pram, Bendix, and Autolite, quality product from Allied Automotive. By Nestle Crunch, chocolate is scrunches when it crunches. That's why you love Nestle Crunch. And by Honda Power Equipment, lawn mowers, riding mowers, and portable generators made to last. Well, it's the last go round for the California Angels. They began today a half a game behind Kansas City. Baltimore leading. They started the day seven behind the Yankees. So it's 4 2 Baltimore in the night. You ever notice that dugouts always are always so dirty? Like, I mean, if they had inspectors, they'd all be getting the R's littered. And well, they have a woman look. who comes in on Wednesdays. Look at that. And that was perfectly clean before the game. Line drive right at Ray Knight, and it brings him to his knees. Oh, that's a head shake. He's had two tough plays right there where it's been, when he's been in close and both been hit very hard. He's come up with both of them. This Mac one a line Lamar drive, yeah. In the fifth inning. Lenny Dykstra led off with a home run, and that game is underway. The Mets leading the Giants one to nothing. The Mets, of course, trying to get on track. They're four and a half back of the Cardinals. The Giants are a game back of the Reds. Aguilera and Grant are the pitchers in that game. So one out in the ninth. And Dick Schofield, the batter. And of course, for the Angels, they have to feel they let a golden opportunity slip away in the seventh inning. 
When Boone and Pettis singled, Jones ran for Boone, and Jones, trying to get a jump on a possible bunt, was picked off second base. So that when McLemore then walked, instead of having the bases loaded and nobody out, the Angels had two on with one out, and Downing hit into a double play. So that was their big chance to get even. Schofield three times hit fly balls to right field. The last time the ball dropped in for a base hit. Popped it up. And it'll be behind the plate for Terry Kennedy. So the Angels are down to their last out. We'd like to remind you the executive producer of NBC Sports, Michael Weissman, the coordinating producer for NBC Baseball, Harry Coyle. The telecast of today's Game of the Week has been produced by George Finkel, directed by John Gonzalez, pregame produced by Les Dennis, pregame directed by Doug Graber, technical directors Mike Stramiski and Marilyn Altman. But Scott McGregor is one out away from his second win of the year. Meanwhile, Gus Polidor is going to come up and bat for Rupert Jones. Get a right-handed bat in there. So Polidor hitting 100. He hadn't played much. He's one for 10. That's right. down to their last strike. So Jack O'Connor trying to close the door and give McGregor a win. And that does it for Polidor and for the Angels. And for Scotty McGregor, he wins his second of the year. And the local boy comes back to beat the Angels for the 20th time in his career. And his record here in Anaheim is 12 and 3. So McGregor gets the win. Baltimore continues to hit home runs. Fred Lynn and Jim Dwyer contributed today. They now have 57 home runs to lead the majors, 29 home runs in their last nine games. Well, this week's NBC Miller Lite player of the game is Scott McGregor. Miller Lite happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of McGregor to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. The losing pitcher, Mike Witt, 5 and 3, 0 oh and 1, 4 and 9 lifetime. And we'll be back after these messages from your local station. Delighted. Baltimore defeated the Angels 4-2. McGregor beat Witt. Home runs by Lynn and Dwyer. Next week will be at Chase Stadium to see the Dodgers and the Mets. Others will see the Atlanta-Chicago ball game. And meanwhile, we're about ready to close up shop. It was a 2-2 tie, and Doug DeSensei suffered a damaging injury to his throat, and we certainly hope he'll be okay. A jarring blow to the Adams apple, and he had to come out just to add more misery to the Angels story. The Angels have Howell coming back, but Weiniger is out, Candelaria is out, McCaskill is out, Donnie Moore is day-to-day, -day, Hendricks is out, and of course, Doug DeSensei now is out for at least a day or so. For Baltimore, they hope maybe the bad times are over from August to the end of last year, and after a, a good start, they hit a slump and lost 11 out of 13, and now, as Scotty McGregor said, what we need is some wins, which is the battle cry for every ball player. That's what every ball player wants to do, and I'll say this, it was good to see him seated on the bench watching his teammates go to that big beat. Many times they were just going to clubhouse, not with him. It was good to see. And for Baltimore, two more home runs, 29 in their last nine games, 57 to lead the Major League. We'll look forward to chatting with you from Shea Stadium in New York when we see the Dodgers and Mets. And until then, hope things go well for you over the weekend. For Joe Garagiola, this is Vin Scully saying so long from Anaheim Stadium where Baltimore defeated the Angels 4-2. to